That's a first. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining this basically lightning talk on understanding ERC 4337. Um, if you're here in this room, you're obviously familiar with it. I am Matt Cutler. I'm founder and CEO of Block Native. Uh, we build core infrastructure for the Ethereum network. We're a, a block builder, a relay, and we provide uh, all sorts of tooling like Web3 onboard and uh, gas estimation. And we've been doing a bunch of work in 4337. Um, I have been in the space for almost five years, and when I started to read about 4337, I was nothing but confused by it. And uh, I was really trying to wrap my mind around it and, and really couldn't. And I started to reach out to people far smarter than me in the category and ask them to explain it, and what I learned was none of them could explain it either. And I realized that we kind of lacked a coherent mental model for 4337 and how it worked. And so I wound up doing a deep dive and uh, publishing a Twitter thread that kind of blew up that, that's now kind of used, I think, for a large part as the mental model of 4337 as user intents. And what I want to do is sort of go through that and dive in as rapidly as we can because we don't have a ton of time. So uh, what do we know about 4337? It fundamentally makes transactions programmable and expressive, which we believe as an ecosystem will massively improve user experience. Um, it does so by abstracting away intense fees authentication and enabling social recovery of keys so we don't need users to worry about uh, managing private keys uh, on their own. But it has this super funny property, which is no hard fork required, which all of you all know, it's an ERC, not an EIP. And the question is, how do you do all of that without changing the network? And uh, the realization is, to figure this out, to build the mental model, you have to go backwards. So if, if you've ever seen the movie um, Ready Player One, there's a scene about why not we go backwards for once, backwards really fast. And so let's start with the standard Ethereum EOA transaction flow, what we have today. User uses their non-custodial wallet to engage with an EOA. The EOA submits a signed transaction to the public mempool. That goes to a builder. Builder talks to a relay. Uh, relay sends block to validator, and that goes on chain. And there's some extra steps in here uh, associated with MEV for private mempools and searcher bundles and stuff like that. That's the world we live in today. And so what does 4337 change about all of this? Well, you can basically look at the, uh, the stretched orientation and say, 4337 is all up here, OK? Everything before the EOA. And that was sort of the big unlock for me, was uh, before 4337, we have EOAs, and after 4337, we have EOAs. And this is why we don't need a hard fork. So we have this new network actor known as a bundler. The bundler acts as an EOA proxy on behalf of the user. Now, this is something that I think is super important as we go through all of this is, while 4337 brings forward a whole bunch of new possibilities, it also adds a bunch of new complexity to the network. New characters, new actors, new incentives, new interactions, new possibilities, um, new things that can go wrong. And so this is why we at Block Native have been quite active in trying to drive uh, fundamental understanding because we think there's a bunch of really interesting things happening under the cover, a bunch of interesting consequences that we as an ecosystem don't fully understand because 4337 is just really rolling out now. It's not widely deployed. And many of the thorny issues we think will come out only when we're at significant scale which is pretty interesting. So uh, the bundler receives user ops from the alt mempool. Uh, this is a massive change to the network. Today we enjoy a single public mempool. By the way, there's a whole bunch of private mempools. And we're going to move into a network where there are now two mempools, but not really two, two because the alt mempool is somewhat of a misnomer. They're actually alt mempools with an, with an S. There might be many alt mempools. And so now you're going to have this issue of mempool fragmentation. And mempools are really significant. This, by the way, is what Block Native does more than anything is mempools. If on-chain data represents what happened, mempools are why it happened. All of MEV is in mempools. And so uh, today, you have this relatively simple model of the public mempool and then private mempools. And that model is going to break down into many mempools. And therefore, observability starts to be a big hassle. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And there's all sorts of opportunities for, one, confusion, and two, lack of trust. So we think observability and alt mempools are going to be significant. But by the way, this is a trend. If we look down the road to the rest of the Ethereum roadmap, almost every stage introduces additional mempools. So the mempool construct is quite useful because it allows uh, untrusted actors to basically make bids and submit stuff against each other without real concern about denial of service attacks. 
but they have negative properties as well, like poor observability, for instance, and manipulation. And so uh, as we go forward with 4337, we think that's going to be a space to pay a lot of attention to. Um, Users don't submit transactions, they submit uh, intents in the form of user ops. Believe it or not, they were not really perceived as intents at least broadly until we sort of uh, went forward with this model. So the basic idea is the user intends to do something and the bundler acts as the, the uh, sort of bun ro rolls them all together and turns them into signed transactions. And of course, the final step here is a user with the 4337 wallet. But as before, we had special uh, elements of the user transaction flow for MEV. We're also going to have additional flows here for MEV. So uh, whereas before, so by the way, for those of you who are not nerds about MEV in the way that I am, MEV stands for maximal extractable value. It's the value that you can get by controlling uh, the contents of blocks. It's the contents in inclusion, exclusion, ordering. And so now what happens is, uh, at the builder level, that's where MEV is controlled. Builders are the ones who determine the contents of blocks. But now you have this new actor called the bundler who's going to determine uh, contents of bundled transactions out of the alt mempool. So the alt mempool and bundlers represent a new source of MEV. And so who the bundlers are, what those actors are, and what they're doing may largely, may have significant determinations on user settlement and uh, um, uh, you know, routing and things like that. And then what's also interesting is bundlers submit transaction to the mempool and those may be then subsequently reordered by searchers and builders for MEV. So now I have two order MEV. MEV at the user intent layer and MEV at the EOA layer. And so again, it creates new complexity uh, happening on the network. Um, so there you go, this is ERC4337, the user intent layer, there's some pieces at the end, the entry point smart contract will upstate the wallets, and basically this is it. So the whole idea is it's an intent layer that happens upstream of the signed transaction, and the net benefit of this is it doesn't require a significant upgrade, i.e. hard fork, to the network. Um, Let's dive into this. Oh, so uh, changes everything or nothing. We talk about that. So let's dive in a little bit to each one of these major areas. Uh, the smart contract wallet communicates via user ops. User ops are programmable, extensible, combinable. They allow all sorts of new things to happen, um, basically enabling composable transactions. So this is one of the things that I think is most exciting about 4337 is today transactions are fairly fixed. They have a fairly narrow definition, a very limited scope that you can do with them. Under 4337 and user ops, it opens up the design space quite a bit. And we can have all sorts of new and elaborate and uh, uh, just, just brand new experiences for users at the programmable transaction level. This is significant because as far as I know in the history of transaction systems, going all the way back, credit cards, stocks, you've never been able to program transactions themselves. I mean, it's a weird thing to think about. Like, what's a credit card transaction? It's what the credit card net network tells you it is. What's a stock trade? It's what the exchange tells you it is. What's an Ethereum transaction? It's an EOA, right? And now, Transactions themselves get programmable. That creates a whole bunch of new developer expressivity. That's pretty fun and interesting. Um, these user ops, again, go into alt mempools. Um, and uh, believe it or not, I mean, this is still pretty nascent. The peer-to-peer -peer layer of the alt mempools is still basically being developed right now. So while we think about 4337 is here and now, there's still a whole bunch of stuff sort of underneath the covers that really matter. And, and fundamentally, the idea is bundlers will each operate their own alt mempool. So for every bundler, you may have a distinct alt mempool. It starts to get confusing as you say, which bundlers are being used where, which wallets communicate with which bundlers, how does that all go? It starts to get interesting at that level. Um, uh, this will confound observability, we talked about that. Uh, the bundlers then take these user ops and bundle them together into something that looks a lot like an internal transaction right now, but that fundamentally, uh, bundlers start to look a lot like MEV searcher builders. And so are bundlers gonna be net new actors who aren't really participants in the network today, or are they gonna be existing network actors who are quite active in the MEV space, i.e. searcher builders? And the reason why we think that's likely what's gonna happen is to be a good bundler, you need all the same skills to be a good builder. And it turns out it's really, really hard to be a competitive builder, and it's quite competitive to be an effective searcher, and it's not a whole bunch of extra work for those players to move into this category. So if you're not familiar with the PBS market, if you're not familiar with who the relays are, who the builders are, who the searchers are, which are a little, less op a little more opaque, um, we believe that those players will wind up having a pretty significant uh, impact on the world of 4337. 
Um, uh, paymasters, we haven't talked about paymasters yet. So paymasters have this cool property of being able to sponsor transactions. So uh, what you can do is you can, a paymaster can basically cover the gas fees of, for the, the user ops, right? Um, but there's this really interesting property of the paymaster is they see the transaction first. Because basically the transaction says, I want to use this paymaster, and before anything can happen, the paymaster has to say, yes, I will sponsor this, or no, I won't. In the world of MEB, those who see transactions first have an edge. So it starts to get kind of interesting as which players may want to operate paymasters and why, because they basically sit higher in the stack than other players, and the higher in the stack you, s you have, the lower latency you have, first crack you have, et cetera. So the paymaster category is sort of interesting, and just like everything else in 4337, uh, they're programmable, right? So you can sponsor uh, gas fees with uh, ERC-20 tokens, you can sponsor them with off-chain mechanisms like your credit card or even your credit card miles, but they can have conditional payments, which is pretty fun. So you might say, hey, my paymaster will sponsor the first 110s. After that, you're on your own. Or if you have a certain NFT in your wallet, you get access to this paymaster, right? And so there's a whole bunch of interesting programmability and infrastructure that can be developed around paymasters to enable new classes of user experiences that go forward. Um, and so finally, and I'm moving super quick, I hope everyone appreciates just how fast I speak, uh, is this the great unlock? And so here's just a simple example of what we're, why we think ERC-4337 is super exciting. So meet Alice. Um, Alice is a super fan of a hypothetical music artist named Sailor Twift. Um, she's a top listener on Spotify. She's active in the forum. She uh, has attended a bunch of shows. and and. Taylor, or Sailor Twift wants to reward loyalty, but in using the existing mechanisms like Ticketmaster, there's no really easy way to do so. Um, there's no uh, uh, verifiable way, there's no uh, uh, um, programmable way, and, and basically Taylor, Sailor Twift wants to have a direct relationship with her fans, not mediated by the capabilities or limitations of someone like Ticketmaster. So what to do? A super fan NFT, right? Super straightforward, issue the NFT, uh, the fan can have it, we're all good to go, except for one little problem, Alice doesn't know shit about crypto. So she doesn't know the first thing about custodial wallets and MetaMask or Ledger or anything else. She's just a regular old person. And so now she's sort of locked out. And this is this big gulf that we have. Um, enter 4337, and hypothetically, her Visa card could be her non-custodial wallet. She doesn't need to do anything else, but it gets even cooler. Alice uses her Visa card to pay for her Spotify subscription. So Sailor Twift says, hey, we'll do a promotion with Spotify, which will identify our top fans, we'll issue an NFT, and it will go onto the Visa card that they use to pay for their Spotify account. Easy peasy. And then when the super fan Alice shows up, for her show, for, for the experience, all she needs to do is present her Visa credentials, which by the way, may be very, via her uh, uh, wallet on her phone, and she can demonstrate access to the experiences. She can prove that she has the NFT. She could sell or transfer it. It suddenly gets super fluid. And this, we think, is this very interesting unlock where now everybody can have a 4337 wallet. And this is the key for unlocking the next billion users. We're gonna do top-down and bottoms-up uh, growth for the Web3 category moving forward, but let's be honest, there's a whole bunch of users with existing experiences and we can meet them where they are using this technology as long as we uh, uh, build it in ways that are easy to use for those individuals. So we do 4337 enabled infrastructure and I think I'm out of time. So uh, I wanna thank you for attending my lightning talk on understanding 4337 and all the implications about it. Do we have time for questions? No, nope, we do not. Okay, if you have any questions, I'm M. Cutler on Twitter or see me down here afterwards. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.